Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it a good day? Good day, start of another good week. Uh, welcome and good morning to all those watching from home and worshiping uh, with us. We have 106 uh, viewers right now, and uh, we do not, we're not told uh, the location, so you're going to have to use your imagination for where all those people are, but we're glad you're with us. Um, there have been, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fortunate man, I want to start out and say that, and, and just start out with kind of sharing this thought with you, that uh, when my three daughters, of course, at different times, uh, were baptized, following you know, them being baptized, I would uh, receive, uh, you know, um, we're happy for you, and kind of mutual, kind of joint uh, group. We we celebrate together, right? Each soul born into Christ, and so uh, when that was uh, each of my three daughters, periodically someone would say congratulations, and that was uh, that was always a little little uh, odd in one sense because I I didn't feel like I had you know that this was uh, really me. Of course, it's God, but it it's my child, and it's it. So in a way, it was odd. Um, to hear congratulations, and yet in another way, that is the most fitting thing to say, uh, because it is a it is a most blessed place to be as a parent for your child to submit their life to Christ, and so um, congratulations is a is a big part of of how I want you. Uh, and how we should understand Matthew chapter 5. Turn in your Bibles. We're going to look at the Beatitudes. And the, and the word Beatitude just means a, a, a extreme bless, blessedness. And so uh, these Beatitudes, we'll look at nine of them. Uh, the ninth one really expands on the eighth one. So, uh, you know, in, there are eight. And these are ways in which us as Christians, how we're blessed. And so, uh, as we read through these, we see, and really the message of Scripture is to us in Christ as Christians, the idea of congratulations uh, is in order. It, it's a very fitting thing. The truth is, and it's not that we've done anything, it's what God has done for us. Uh, we, we are all in a blessed state to be in Christ, aren't we? Amen. Uh, we are most fortunate among people on this planet. And so... Uh, let's start in verse Matthew 5, verse 2. He opened his mouth, this is Jesus, of course, uh, and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In, uh, in the first century, the Jews had a common thought, and that is uh, the wealthy were, were in favor. God had their favor, or they had God's favor, and not so much with uh, poverty or with the poor. And so, and they also kind of viewed that with health as well. If you were, were sick, you know, there, there, there might be uh, a reason that you're sick. And so this idea uh, actually kind of connects to a false doctrine today that's widely taught, which is the, the, the doctrine of health, wealth, and happiness that uh, in Christ that God wants you uh, wealthy. He wants you happy. He wants you healthy. Well, it's not that God doesn't want those things, but... But Jesus never really, Jesus didn't teach that. He didn't teach his disciples to pursue wealth or teach his disciples that if, if you're sick, then God is unhappy with you. Uh, or if you're not happy, that, that God wants whatever it takes for you to be happy. Uh, so that's a false doctrine. And this, this beatitude really strikes at that. Poor in spirit, this would, this would be in contrast to rich in you know, pride. Uh, could be, could be self-righteous pride. Uh, could be uh, what often goes along with a uh, temptation of wealth and money is pride. And so this is, this is humility. Uh, it also tends to come along with physical poverty. And so the, the truth is, and these are ironic, all of these beatitudes are ironic. You would not think that a person either poor in spirit in uh, humility or someone in poverty would be blessed. But if they're in Christ, they're to be blessed. Why? Because their, their riches are in the kingdom of heaven, a spiritual kingdom. Uh, and that's something that we all possess. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, this, this is not just, it's not 
uh, you know, blessed are the sad, this would be mourning about sin. This would be blessed are those who recognize sin, maybe in their own life or in the lives of the, wor you know, of the world. If you see things going on in the world that is sinful and it saddens you, you're blessed because you're set, you are grieved as God is grieved. That means you're in spirit with God. You will be comforted. Um, and God is the, the God of all comfort. We know that. So uh, look at verse 5, Ble the next one. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, meekness is the opposite of arrogance. It's the opposite of self-interest. Um, one, one person, these are contrasted ideas here. Uh, one is very uh, selfish, the other is selfless. So um, the, the prideful and the strong and the, and, and the one who uses their strength um, to their own benefit and you know, um, takes advantage of others, that person is not meek. So meekness is, uh, it's not to be confused with weakness. If someone, Jesus was meek and yet Jesus was not weak. Jesus had ultimate power, Amen. right? He had all the power. He's very, very powerful. Um, but he restrained that power. And so us, there are times that you have knowledge to embarrass someone because you can point out something uh, and, and, and beat them with your words. Or you may have power in finances. You're, you may have physical stature power. Meekness is restraint. It's humility. It's saying, I could do this, but I'm not going to. Um, out, out of interest for glorifying God. The idea of inheriting the earth, is it may sound odd, but to, the, to a Jewish Christian, this would make perfect sense. Because remember, Abraham, one of the great promises, of course, God promised Abraham all these descendants, but He also promised all Abraham the uh, land, the promised land. And to, in ancient times, land was everything. If you could possess it, uh, in our if you think about it, in our state's history, we're we're the sooner state, and so uh, we understand the idea of what uh, you know, uh, this idea of staking a claim on land. And our land's history says, here it is. If you want it, come and build on it. It's yours. So it was a, a very pioneer spirit, but it's also a history of valuing property, land. And so land in what Jesus is saying here shall inherit the earth. This is inherit something very valuable, but it's not to the Jew. They would understand this is a spiritual inheritance. It's not God's not going to give us something here that's going to be so great. Our, our inheritance is the land in heaven. Whatever size your property is in heaven, you'll love it. Right. Big property, little property, doesn't matter. Little apartment. Fine. Right. We don't we don't know what it's going to be like. Uh, exactly, but we want to be there, and that's that's what this is about. So, uh, blessed are the meek. Uh, verse six: Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Um, I, I think it's safe to say we all want righteousness, which means right living. It's doing right according to what God says. Uh, holiness, same thing. So we want that we or we wouldn't be here we want to walk with god we want to please god and live a live a holy righteous life jesus here he doesn't say desire it he says crave it you're you're hungry for it you thirst for it so this isn't part way it's not lukewarm it's not um you know, I, I, I kind of care about what God wants. This is I really care. Um, and, and I have a quote that um, I don't know who said this, but I love this statement. And it says, the greatness of the soul is measured by the is measured by the number, the intensity and the quality of its desires. So I'll read that again. The greatness of the soul is measured by the number, the intensity, and the quality of its desires. What that's saying is the greatness of a person. You know how we look up to people and we think different ones are great, and we, we our society worships uh, the 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 you know the greatest of the athletes and the famous and the most talented and gifted artists and so on. That's what our society and the powerful we worship those. Our society worships those people. 
this statement is saying the greatness of a person is found in the number, intensity, and quality of their desires. What do they want? Isn't that an odd thought? So if you're wanting to evaluate, should I look up to this person? Should I follow you know, uh, this person's example? Should I think they're great? You know how certain famous ones were to walk in the room? Some of us would lose our minds, right? We might want to go you know, talk to them. Uh, pre-corona might want to go shake their hand. Some might want to get an autograph. That's how we fawn over famous people, right? We're foolish, by the way, for doing that. Scripture says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Find someone hungry for righteousness and you will find someone to follow and look up to, right? If they're following Christ, follow that. Uh, that's who we should admire, and that's who we should be. We would be blessed for that. So this, I, I'm, I, hope, I hope you're seeing in, this, in these Beatitudes the fact that these are, these are ironic. These are not what, our kids don't learn these in school, right? And you don't learn these in the world. We don't learn these in our society. Our society doesn't value these things. But God tells us this is where true riches are. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so this is, this is humility. This is someone who has a tender, pure heart. Um, we teach our children to be strong. We need to also teach our children to have a pure heart. Amen. If your heart is pricked because you see pain or you see wrong, or you have done wrong, blessed are the pure in heart, because those are the ones who will see God. They'll see God. You can see God here in how God acts. We'll see God in heaven, but those who with a hard, dark heart or a sinful heart won't see God. <clears throat> blessed are the peacemakers. Again, there's no hall of fame for peacemakers. Our, our, our society doesn't admire peacemakers, do they? They admire people who get things done. Winners, achievers, right? The successful. We don't admire peacemakers. Those who are, are, are not so much worried about um, being, being wronged or being offended, but they're worried about unity or they're worried about relationships or they're focused on um, creating peace out of a source of conflict. And then number 10, and, and uh, the next one is an expansion of this one, but those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. We would not think to congratulate someone persecuted for their faith. Imagine, uh, one, imagine one of our college students in a, in a college classroom, or a high school student for that matter, and uh, there's an occasion where they're called upon and they answer and, and, and what they speak reflects their faith. In other words, they don't deny their belief that we're here because we have a creator. And, and then they're ridiculed and then they're laughed at. And then the professor, right, belittles their um, position. And that Christian doesn't change their their mind on that doesn't change their tune. Um, they stay faithful is what I'm saying. When we, for us to think about that, and if that's one of ours here, and, and we were to talk to them, we, would, we might say, I'm sorry that you were treated that way. We would feel compassion for, because it is, it is hurtful to be persecuted. I don't know that any of us would think to say, congratulations. Congratulations. Good for you. That's what Jesus is saying. Blessed are, and all of these are that way. But this one really kind of, kind of stands out in that way. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Because it means you're doing right. And what it costs us to do right and be right in God's eyes is so far worth whatever we suffer. That's the message of Scripture. Be right with God. Let the chips fall where they fall. Let people say what they want to say. Let them do what they want to do. Jesus said, don't fear the one who can kill the body. Kill the one, fear the one who can cast both body and soul into hell. That's who we fear. So, yes, congratulations. You stood faithful. Good. 
good for you. Um, that, that, that is the message of the Beatitudes. So let's read on. Verse 13 goes further into, with this thought. Blessed, uh, bless, or excuse me, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. And Jesus will go on to talk about if the salt loses its saltiness, which um, what that means is as Christians, we are to stand out in this world. We are to be, we are to be uh, lights in this world. We are to be salt, which is flavor. We are to be uh, uh, sources of hope in this world, examples of goodness in this world, right? That's what Christians are to be. And Jesus says, if you lose that, if you lose that and you go back to acting like the world acts, God's going to cast you out because that's, you're, not, you're not righteous anymore. You're not salt to the earth anymore. But let's think about salt for a minute. Uh, I, I had a job, one of my jobs when I was in college, I worked at a movie theater. And in orientation working there, they said, now on break, you'll have breaks every so often and, uh, and a lunch break. And on your break... You can eat. You can eat some pop. You can take. You know, the popcorn's free, and the soda fountain's free. So you have your own cup. And what we would, we couldn't take a, a bucket for the popcorn, which is how I eat my popcorn, by the way, if you haven't figured it out. But anyway, could they inventory those things? So we would, we would uh, put our popcorn in the boxes, the empty boxes that the candy would come in. So you'd have all these empty kind of boxes of different sizes, and I would always get a good size one and fill that up with popcorn and go eat popcorn on my break. Uh, and I thought at first I would, I thought I, I might get burnt out on popcorn. I might at the end of this job not even like popcorn, but that was not true. I still love popcorn. And right before we would go on break, it may not surprise you to know that uh, commonly we would we'd pop one more little batch, you know, one more batch before break. And uh, we'd, I would double oil it and extra season and that popcorn would come out bright orange right bright orange i loved it uh loved it and so uh, have you ever tried to eat popcorn without salt i do that some now i'm uh being 50. i uh zach i had to watch my health and write these kind of things but uh you'll get there some of you young ones will understand it. anyway eating popcorn without salt is an acquired taste so we understand what Jesus is saying here. We are to be, we are to be uh, good news to the world. We are to f- reflect God's goodness and to be very different from the world. Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. Um, and our good works, verse 16, they give glory to our Father who is in heaven. If you, if you uh, decorate uh, your, prop, your uh, place with Christmas lights at your house... Um, you may decorate your backyard, but I doubt you do very much decorating there. We decorate the front. Why do we do that? It's really not, that's really not even for us to see. What you see is inside your house, mostly. We decorate the front. We put out some lights. That's just a common tradition practice in our culture. We do it to bless other people, for other people to see, Right? To be cheered by it. Uh, that's what you, and so that's kind of a concept with us what light is for. Light is not to be hidden. And as Christians, we are not to be like the world. The world's dark. They don't need, the world doesn't need more darkness. It needs some lights. It needs some people who are different. Look at Colossians uh, chapter 4, verse 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Uh, do you think of yourself as an insider? You know, we are, we are Christians, so we understand, you understand that as a, a Christian, uh, but we are also insiders. We're inside something, and the something is the kingdom, saying, a.k.a. the church. We're insiders. Everyone you deal with, all the jerks and goofballs and rude people of the world are outsiders, right? right. You, anybody deal with jerks? Anybody have to, have to be around people who, right, make you test your faith and your religion and test the Jesus in you? Yep. Right. I didn't say, do you work with people like that? <laughs> um, we, uh, Yvette's not here. I'll talk to her about that. Um, we, all those people, we tend to look at them as just jerks and whatever. We tend to, we tend to 
to kind of frame them that way, but they are outsiders. They're outsiders. And we're trying to recruit those people. You're trying to win that jerk, right? We're trying to save those people to get them to where God saves them. That's, a, that's our job. So that's, what, that's why I walk, with, walk in wisdom. What's the opposite of that? Opposite of that is do like the world does and, and do what you do. And if somebody acts rude to you, give it back to them and don't take that. And right, that's how the world is. But we're to walk in wisdom. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. How should Christians talk? Kindly. Righteously. Our language should be pure. Our speech should be pure. I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, the book of James says, if you can wrangle the tongue, you, you, you know, the tongue is wild. So I'm not saying it's easy. But that's how our speech should be. We should be different. If someone treats us rudely, we should return it with kindness, and other people should look at that and say, Wow, wow, what's going on here? Walk with wisdom toward outsiders. So, always gracious, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each person. How are we to answer them? Well, they were a jerk to me, so here's what I told them. Listen to this. I didn't put up, I won't put up with that. I said... That's not what Paul, that's not what God is telling us to do. God says you're trying to win that person. So love them. Titus. So we'll get into this a little bit. I have a little time to get into this passage. Not a passage that we look at often. It is a good passage because it, it speaks to every one of us. Uh, every one of us who's of an age of, a, of accountability, uh, an age to understand right and wrong and, and eternity. Uh, because this passage speaks to old men, young men, old women, and young women. And so you decide who you are, right? Go ahead. You can look at the other two, though. Go ahead and look at the older ones, in case you don't think you are. Older men are to be sober-minded, which means level-headed. Level-headed. Dignified. Dignified is, is not as often seen in our world, is it? Self-controlled, sound in faith, in love. That means not rude. Sometimes uh, older men can be rude. In love, in steadfastness, uh, right? Stay the course, steady. Um, that's, this is for older men. Some things that us older men need. I said that. Older women. I'm not saying who you are. Older women. Be reverent. Reverent. Not slanderers. That means talking bad about people. Not slanderers. Or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. There to be godly, loving, right? And then in wisdom, I think Paul tell, asked the older women to teach the younger women. Paul speaks directly to the men, the women, or the older men, the older women, the younger men, but he asked the older women to speak to the younger ladies. Train the young women to love their husbands and children. And, and I'll tell you ahead of time, spoiler alert, this list will sound archaic, this list will sound ridiculous. This list does not fly in our world anymore. Not in our culture. Our culture has evolved. And, but, but I ask you to consider what our God says. Love your husbands and children. To be self-controlled. Pure. That's not what our world is, is applauding or teaching. Right? Our world's not they're, it's not, they're not training their daughters to be pure. They're training their daughters to be safe. Those are two different things. To be pure. Working at home. The statement working at home, don't confuse it to say that it's wrong for a, a woman or a young mother to work outside the home. That's not what Scripture is saying. Scripture is speaking to what uh, what we find in society, in 
of the human race, and that is, ladies, God has created women um, re- uh, especially good relationally. Uh, mom is the cornerstone of the family. Mom holds the family together. Uh, there's a reason that Mother's Day is a big day, right? Mothers are a blessing from God. And uh, how the home is, is important to a woman. And so Paul is, and Scripture is pointing out for a woman to put time and effort into that, even to the point of being a homemaker and, work, and not working outside the home, but working inside the home, the point, I'm, the point I'm making is Scripture uh, applauds that. Our society minimizes it. Does that make sense? There's value here, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, kind. Kindness is not taught. Kindness is not valued, but to be kind. Submissive to their own husbands. Again, and this is not a, a lengthy passage about submission or, or a husband-wife relationship here. Uh, Ephesians gets into that and talks about husbands, you lay down your life for your wife. You treat her like a queen. Wives, you submit to your husband. Uh, you support his leading. And these are, so these are qualities that we're losing. The world is losing and the church is also losing. Right? Because we're fighting against our nature that says, if I submit, then I'm going to lose. If I submit, I'm, 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 I'm not going to have. If, I'm, if I submit, it's going to be bad. And yet, Scripture teaches us as Christians, submission is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Um, that the Word of God may not be reviled. Younger men. Incidentally, real quick. Submission, submitting to their husbands then this statement that may seem like it doesn't even fit, but reviled means to, be, to speak against. And what it's saying is, young ladies, when young ladies submit to their husbands, they honor God's Word. They honor it. They, they, when we as Christians live right, we honor what God is saying, and we, and we make it glorified. All right, younger men, be self-controlled. Self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects a model of good works. Young men have strength, and they can do a lot of good things. In your teaching, show integrity. Integrity is um, a moral uprightness. This is doing the right thing even if no one's watching. Dignity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. So that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing to say about us. And that's our, that's our goal, that the world, they can't find anything bad to say about us because we're living God's way. Um, just real quick, we're running out of time, but a passage here, um, Paul speaks to bond servants about their position. And again, submission, um, honor those who have authority over you. And we'll always have ones who have authority over us. Honor them. This passage, uh, I'll hit in real quick and then leave us with a thought. It's a reminder, do all things without grumbling or disputing. If I remind you, church, this life is a test. Uh, The Bible says God will test us. Our trials are tests. They're spiritual tests. 2020 is a test. How will God's people do? The, world's, the world is boo-hooing. And, and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying shame on them for boo-hooing. It's hard. But how's the church doing? It's a test. Do we still have faith in God? That you may be blameless, innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights. The, the message of this sermon is that as Christians, we should really stand out. We should be very different. The world should look at us. Those folks are different. Amen. We should be very, very different in a righteous way. Okay? Uh, I'll leave you with uh, this song. You may probably uh, never heard this song, but it's by Brad Paisley, Those Crazy Christians. And I, I don't advocate every single word of the song, but... Uh, but it makes a good point. So it says, those crazy Christians, I was going to sleep in today, but the church bells woke me up and they're half a mile away. Those crazy Christians dressed up driving down my street, get their weekly dose of guilt before they head to Applebee's. They pray before they eat and they pray before they snore. 
They pray before a football game and every time they score. Every untimely passing, every dear departed soul <clears throat> is just another good excuse to bake a casserole. Those crazy Christians go and jump on some airplane and fly to Africa or Haiti, risk their lives in Jesus' name. No, they ain't the late night party kind. They curse the devil's whiskey while they drink the Savior's wine. A famous TV preacher has a big affair and then one tearful confession and he's born again. Someone yells hallelujah and they shout and clap and sing. It's like they can't wait to forgive someone for just about anything. Those crazy Christians. Instead of being outside on this sunny afternoon, they're by the bedside of a stranger in a cold hospital room. And every now and then they meet a poor lost soul like me who's not quite sure just who or what or how he ought to be. They march him down the aisle, and then the next thing you know, they dunk him in the water, and here comes another one of those crazy Christians. They look to heaven their whole life, and I think, what if they're wrong? But what if they're right? You know, it's funny, much as I'm baffled by it all, if I ever really needed help, well, you know who I'd call? is those crazy Christians. That's how the world should see us. Crazy. And in many ways they won't understand, but in many ways they will see God in us. We're going to sing a song of encouragement, Have Thine Own Way. Uh, a great song for us to end on. You may be here and have uh, something you'd like us to pray for you about. There may be one that you've never given your life to Christ. And you'd like to have your sins washed away and become a Christian today. Uh, we'd love that. If you have a need, please come while we stand and sing. Have thine own way, Lord.